Welcome everybody uh, to this new series of workshops. Um, this first one is entitled Tailing, Tailing Stamp Brake Assessments with River Flow 2D MT Modern Tailings Model. Um, my name is Rinaldo Garcia. I'm the Director of Development and Applications of Hydronia and Hydronia Europe. And um, uh, I, I close collaborator of this uh, series of workshop, for, uh, especially for tailing stamps, is Adolfo Correa. Adolfo is the president of Brazil Hydro and is our uh, representative in Brazil. And he has been instrumental in promoting the, the use of the River Flow 2D model in Brazil. So I want to thank him for all the collaboration that uh, is, is doing now. Um, so this is the the agenda that we are going to be following today. We are going to split the workshop in three parts. Um, each part is approximately 45 minutes to an hour. So the whole duration it will be probably a little less than, than three hours. And there will be a break in between each part. So we'll we'll do the first one. This is an overview. We're going to make uh, an introduction uh, about the, the problematic of tailing dams and tailing dam accidents. We'll do a general overview of the river flow to the EMT model. Uh, we'll go over very briefly of the type of equations that we solve, the range of applications, um, the and, and a first look at the model validation. Uh, and then we'll end with the descriptions of the QGIS plugin and data input program for Riverflow 2D. Uh, after each of the parts, uh, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, however, you don't need to wait until the end of the um, um, of the uh, presentation to make your questions. Uh, there is in the question panel a, a question uh, tab and in that you can um, write your questions and when when you write your questions I will read the at the end of each uh, part and then uh, we'll be able to answer them at uh, all of at that time. Um, okay so let me see here. Uh, give me a second. I I will. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so the the second part uh, is is more an in depth uh, look into the fundamentals of the river flow to the MT model. Um, we are going to look at the model equations in depth, the initial conditions and boundary conditions necessary to run the model, assumptions and limitations that uh, uh, of the equations and the model formulations that we use. Also, we are going to be looking at uh, the data parameters that are required and what are the range of the parameters, the type of parameters, uh, when do they need to be used, when not, and so forth. And then uh, we'll have a second look at a model validation with um, uh, some results of uh, the, the model that uh, I think you will find interesting. Uh, the last part uh, is the uh, is an application, and we'll go over the steps necessary to implement the model workflow, initial conditions, uh, initial water surface elevation, initial state, um, inflow boundary conditions, inflow tributaries with uh, clear water, uh, and also comparison of the model results with uh, observations. And uh, at the end, we'll have another question and answer period. So, um, so feel free to um, ask your questions as we go over the the different parts. 
And uh, in the breaks, uh, probably the breaks will be around 50 minutes. I will tell you, depending on how long we take each of the parts, I will tell you how how long we'll take. Uh, we will break, uh, but that will uh, give us time to rest uh, in between the parts. Um, okay, first first uh, things first. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, a number of people uh, without. Uh, who we couldn't uh, do all we do and they have been key factors in developing and also applying the model for very notable cases and uh, the group of, uh, of professionals of the University of Zaragoza in Spain uh, we have a, an agreement uh, with the university that uh, it's been going on for several years already and uh, it's it's uh, been very successful and very productive as well and uh, all of these people that are here especially Pilar Garcia Ravar who is the uh, director of the group and also Pilar Brufao and Javier Murillo, Mario Morales, Javier Fernandez, Isabel and I want to particularly thank uh, this time to Sergio Martinez Aranda, who is uh, a PhD candidate. Actually, he's uh, probably more than a candidate. He's about to finish. He has uh, submitted the thesis already. And uh, many of the slides and, and actually the, the formulations that you see today uh, has uh, been developed by, by Sergio over the last uh, few years. And I want to especially thank him for, for the support and, and the many discussions that we have had uh, in, in the last uh, year. Um, also in Hadronia, I want to thank a number of people that have uh, been uh, also very helpful and, and they are very active in, in the what we do. Uh, They're listed here. And um, well, of course, Brazil Hydro and also the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, but the Inter-American Development Bank is a multilateral um, uh, agency that uh, funds infrastructure projects in, in uh, South America, Central America and the Caribbean. And uh, they have adopted the uh, River Flow 2D model as their main simulation model for inundation analysis and, and sediment transport, uh, urban flooding and uh, they besides funding development they, they have done also uh, uh, a lot of contribution by providing licenses of the model for uh, um, I would say for all the projects that they are doing in the region and uh, they have provided these advanced tools to people that couldn't uh, afford it in the past. And of course, I, I, I need to thank uh, our many uh, clients and users worldwide. Um, not of, uh, you know, the, the, each time we do a new webinar, I have to add more and more people. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't fit to hear all of them, but I uh, have tried to, to be as uh, comprehensive as possible. Uh, but I want to thank them really very much because they have uh, contributed quite a lot in the uh, expansion and development and uh, you know the, the increase in the capabilities of the model because many of the things that we do is to satisfy many of the requests that are made by practitioners and uh, I really want to thank them all. Uh, well, uh, this is what we're going to be doing in the first part. Um, it's, a, it's a general overview of, of the model. Uh, but the main purpose of this workshop uh, is it, it was actually um, decided uh, to answer many questions of our users. The Riverflow 2D MT model is a very comprehensive model, has many capabilities, has uh, have many features and uh, it, it tries to solve a very complex phenomenon, physical flow, which is not easy to represent and to understand sometimes. 
And uh, one of the objectives of today's workshop is to answer many of the questions that, that we have been receiving over the last uh, few months. And uh, in that regard, we are going to be focusing on the main questions that we have been receiving, mainly on the fundamentals of the model and, and the parameters that they use, the data, and some of the uh, uh, clarifications that are required about the initial conditions, boundary condition, etc. So the first part is a general overview, but once we get into the fundamentals, we'll we'll get into the the actual focus of the of the workshop. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, the, the the main um, justification for a model like uh, river flow to DMT is the, the the tremendous impact that many tailing dams accident have created in the environment and in urban areas that uh, have been affected by these accidents. Uh, some of the accidents um, have occurred uh, upstream from uh, populate, populated areas and that has uh, not only generated uh, many material damages but also loss of life. Uh, this slide uh, summarizes some of the events. Uh, there are many pages in this, unfortunately, on this site, many pages that um, list only the major tailing dam failures, and, and probably not all of them. Um, in many of them, it's very interesting because they list the, the release volume, and you've seen some of them, you know, events that have millions of of cubic meters, so there are uh, considerable uh, amounts of material that gets mobilized. But what is uh, more dramatic is the the impacts that they generate. So you have, uh, you know, loss of life uh, and and also material losses that are are in the in the billions of dollars in many cases. So um, the the main idea behind providing to anybody working on tailings dam a tool like river flow to dmt is to uh, be able to have a tool that can support um, projects and studies that eventually can mitigate this type of events so that's the the general idea behind the tool uh, in more, to be more specific, the, the, the purpose of the river flow to DMT model is first to assess tailings run out distances and area of inundation. So we want to be able to predict, if we can, what can happen when a tailing dam occur. And what can happen means uh, determining the run out distances, the area of inundation, the times, at which sensitive areas uh, would be impacted if they occur. Erosion and deposition assessments because that they are uh, modifiers of the, of the environment in a big way. Um, we need to be able to consider multiple inflows and initial deposit with variable properties because that's the nature of the deposits, of the tailings deposit. Uh, determine the depth and velocities of the tailings once they, they move and, and when they stop, if they do. Um, evaluate how these areas are affected as a function of time, so not only as a static way, and very importantly to be able to determine the volume that could be mobilized from an event. So that's a, a big unknown in many tailing dam uh, potential accidents. Uh, so in general, the idea is to provide a tool that would support tailing dam break risk assessments and mitigation. So not only to assess the risk, but also to uh, help in designing mitigation works that could reduce the impact of these events. So that is the, the main purpose that we have behind developing all these highly sophisticated 
tools. Some of the Riverflow 2D typical applications, I would say typical, although there is no nothing typical in tailing stamp applications, but uh, um, it, they involve the common tailing stamp breaks of relatively simple type, uh, tailing mixing with clear water tributaries. So sometimes the tailings uh, can affect the river or can affect the reservoir, and we want to to ensure that we can uh, represent that um, the, the, the mixing or the interaction of the tailings with the tributaries. So they involve not only physical modification to the, the tributaries or the rivers or the reservoirs, but also environmental impact because many of the tailings contain contaminants that can affect the quali uh, water quality of these uh, water bodies. So we need to be able to not only represent the physical changes due to erosion deposition, but also the uh, concentration of the potential pollutants that can arrive to those uh, water bodies. Um, we need to be able to evaluate the, the volume that gets mobilized um and uh, also account for sometimes the analysis of uh, dam breaks includes uh, what is called sunny day that uh, would not have any rainfall but also the wet event that uh, includes the rainfall the rainfall has the effect of diluting or changing the properties of the um of the tailings and that can have also significant impact on the distances that the tailings can travel. And of course, uh, um, applications that uh, aim at assessing the erosion and deposition areas that can uh, occur in these events. Um, so, river flow to the EMT model in a nutshell, uh, I, I would describe the river flow to the EMT model as a two-dimensional hydraulic hydrologic flexible mesh model. Uh, when I say hydraulic hydrologic, it's because it accounts also for uh, not only the routing of the flooding, but also the rainfall and infiltration that could occur during the flooding itself. So in that sense, it's a combined hydrologic hydraulic model. It considers hyper-concentrated non-Newtonian fluids. We'll see what, what that means uh, for those of you not familiar with terms. Um, the numerical aspects of the model uh, are, I would suggest, top of the line in what is available nowadays as method to solve these complex equations. And uh, uh, we use the state-of-the-art finite volume numerical engine that ensures mass and momentum conservation. Um, it can deal with subcritical, supercritical regimes, uh, hydraulic structures. Um, we are um, developing more um, capabilities about hydraulic structures, particularly with, uh, for the, um, the variable properties model that we are going to discuss that uh, presently includes only rainfall. But I will talk about this a little uh, today as well. Uh, it works in English and metric units. Uh, it has uh, two options of uh, graphical user interface, SMS, by Aquaveo and QGIS, which is an open source uh, free uh, software. Um, I need to mention that um, the capabilities available for SMS and QGIS are not the same. Uh, all of the capabilities I'm, I'm talking today uh, are available for QGIS, but unfortunately SMS, uh, one of the problems uh, is that the programming within the SMS environment is, is very cumbersome. Uh, QGIS provides a, a, a Python programming interface that allows to extend and adapt it very well to to other any model that you want to be and it's a general graphical uh, geographical information system and that's one of the reasons that we are focusing our development in QGIS. Um, QGIS interface uh, has all of the capabilities of SMS uh, for River Flow 2D, 
but also provides many other features that are not available in SMS. Um, the, mm, the interface can create hazard maps and animations. Uh, I will show you some examples of that. And, and one of the key features of the RioFlow 2 EMT model is the GPU, um, the operations in GPU hardware. The GPU allows the model to run many times faster than if you run it in a single processor. GPU may have uh, nowadays uh, 10 thousands of processors and more, and that allows the model to run up to 700 times faster for hydrodynamic and even for um, for the uh, MT model can run even up to 200 times faster than uh, a single processor run. The model has uh, several modules, uh, water quality, urban drainage, uh, suspended um, bed load, erosion deposition, uh, and, and the focus of today's uh, workshop, which is the modern debris flow and tailing stamp uh, module, MT. The, the main characteristics of, of the model is that it uses uh, a flexible mesh that uh, has a triangle as its general uh, computational unit. So the triangle is where the action of the model is going on. Each triangle communicates with its uh, neighbors and eventually with the whole mesh. And uh, in the triangle is where the, the, the model computes all the, its unknown. I will go over those uh, later. Uh, but the main uh, the main hydrodynamic uh, variables, which is depth and velocity, velocity is treated as a vector. It can have any direction, and also each triangle can have any size. And you can see here in this urban area where the the, the mesh is refined in some parts and with uh, much smaller uh, uh, triangles than in other parts. Uh, what is important here is that the model computes the unknowns at every triangle. So the more triangles you have, the more detailed you have. And uh, so you can adapt the model resolution according to the data resolution that you have. So um, the main capabilities of the Riverflow 2D uh, model, well, first, we have two models. We, uh, when, when you get uh, a Riverflow 2D MT, actually you're getting uh, one model that is the constant properties fixed bet model and I will describe this, it's a general model that uh, does not uh, do erosion deposition, it's a fixed bed model, and the properties of the fluid do not vary in time or space. So you, it, the, the model computes the depth and velocities, but the properties of the fluid uh, remain invariant. Uh, and then the second model, uh, that is the, the comprehensive one, it's a variable properties erosion deposition. Um, it's uh, it's an almost uh, two-phase model, what we call a mixing phase model, and uh, it accounts for variable density, viscosity, yield stress, of course, depth, velocities, and also changes in depth in in uh, bed elevation uh, to account for erosion and deposition. Um, one of the features of the variable property uh, model is that the gravity term does not assume quasi-horizontal flow. Why is this important? Because in many, I would say most two-dimensional models that, that you find out there, the assumption is that the flow is quasi-horizontal. And that works fine for flat areas or um, river flow, alluvial rivers in, in plains and so forth, because the, the, uh, uh, the slope of the river is very, very small, maybe a few centimeters per kilometer at most. But when you're dealing with uh, tailing stamps or, or dam breaks, uh, oftentimes your, the terrain vary in, in elevation very rapidly and in, in short distances of time and very by a lot. So you have 
big and steep gradients where the quasi-horizontal assumption that is made in the gravity term in most models fail or, or lead to unrealistic results. So in the river flow to DMT model, we use this, uh, this uh, consideration that we adapt the gravitational term according to the slope. Um, the model considers a spatially and temporally variable density, viscosity, and yield stress. I'm talking about the variable properties uh, model. Uh, simulates the mixing of tributaries and initially static fluid. So, for instance, you can model the flow coming from a tailing break that gets into a reservoir filled with water, and it will model the mixing and eventually spill of that uh, break of that second reservoir. Uh, and also the mixing with uh, lakes or, or even rivers that uh, are on the way of the uh, tailings. Um, the bed soil characteristics uh, can be different from those of the flowing material. Uh, that means that the, the terrain can have different sediment type as the one that is flowing and also they can vary in space so the the terrain does not need to be uniform um, the model um, assumes that the material has uh, multiple sediment classes and i will discuss in the second part what is this exactly uh, this is a very very useful concept uh, that I will clarify because it allows you to treat the tributaries, the, the, even the, the uh, type of material in the soil and the material coming from the tailings in a very flexible way and it can be adapted to be realistic for the cases you have. And as the modeling occurs, uh, the uh, the model assumes that uh, the bed can change, bed elevation can change, so you can have entrainment from the bed into the flow that generates erosion, or you can have uh, material from the flowing sediment that uh, uh, deposits in the bed. So you have full interaction between the bed, sediment, and the flowing material. Um, so, the, the model equations that we use, and I will discuss this in the second part in in, in very detailed way, um, is one mass conservation equation for the mixture, two momentum equations for the mixture as well, uh, and then for each sediment class, we have a, a transport equation, and then one equation, one general equation for a bed erosion deposition. So if you have uh, and sediment classes, then you will be solving, or the model will be solving for you, n plus four equations. That means, uh, let's say you have um, uh, four classes defining your sediment, then you will have eight equations being solved at every cell, at every time step, uh, to uh, calculate all the unknowns, velocities, concentrations, etc. There are also auxiliary formulas for deposition and entrainment flux and viscosity and yield stress that uh, uh, complement or close the equations, uh, the momentum equations, and also the transport equations that we need to use. So what are the unknowns that the model calculate uh, at each cell? Uh, well, first, uh, hydrodynamic uh, variables, depth, velocity, components in X or Y direction. Uh, again, this is a full two-dimensional model. The model does not limit the velocity components that you have in, at each triangle. It can have any direction as it should. Um, then for each sediment class, the volumetric concentration, the mixture volumetric concentration for the uh, mixture of sediment, all the classes and the water, uh, density of the mixture, viscosity, and yield stress. So this is calculated at all cells and for each numerical time step. 
Um, the model provides several rheological formulations that um, cover a wide range of uh, typical fluids that can occur in tailings dam or debris flows from purely watery flows that uh, use only a turbulent uh, component that is uh, essentially applicable for water or very dilute type of uh, sediment concentrations. The Bingham models, uh, turbulent Coulomb, turbulent yield. Uh, turbulent Coulomb, uh, I will talk a little bit about this too because they include the, the uh, poor pressure term that has uh, found to be important in, in high uh, in hyper concentrated type of of uh, materials. Uh, the quadratic and granular that is for purely mostly dry uh, material. In terms of the uh, data requirement for the material, because for the for the general application, of course, one of the things you will need uh, is uh, I will discuss is the terrain, but uh, for the material, um, you need to have, for the constant property model, the density, viscosity, and yield stress. That's uh, three variables that you need to provide. They vary a little uh, with the flow resistant relation that you select. You have the selection drop down bottom here. Uh, but uh, these are the main, the main variables that you need to provide. And internal friction angle is also a variable in case of the Coulomb uh, resistance relations. Uh, for those of you who are users of the um, of the model already, you will, will start noting that uh, some changes here. So we have introduced some, I think, changes that uh, will be well welcome by our existing users because they tend to clarify the meaning of several of the parameters and also the use of the parameters depending on the model if it's constant properties model and variable properties i will i will go over this later uh, uh, as well but uh, i think these changes are very important because in previous versions uh, they they probably were a little organized in a in a way that was clear for those who were very familiar with the model, but the, those of you of you who were starting to use the model were not so uh, comfortable with the terms and, and the organization of the data. And we have improved that quite a lot, I think. Uh, okay, so uh, for the variable properties model, um, there are more data um, that is required here. Uh, first, we have the sediment classes that uh, require on its own data characterizing each, each class, uh, the density, uh, diameter of the class, um, uh, the, the shield, shield uh, critical stress, and so forth. Um, and, and this data, uh, class diameter, bed, bed porosity, uh, critical stress, uh, ma material fraction of the bed, of the class in the bed, the viscosity constant, the yield stress constant, uh, is all data that uh, is related to the flow resistance relation. So it change with the flow resistance relation that uh, you select. Um, now, the uh, in the older organization, this is the older uh, tab for the uh, modern tailings flow. Uh, we had uh, the, you know, a, a kind of little confused uh, mixture of the constant and variable model, and we have changed that. But in, in any case, we still have the way to select several formulations to represent how the viscosity and yield stress is computed as a function of the flow uh, concentration or the class concentration. So that's still uh, in the model in variable. Um, okay, so um, as, as model validation, the first uh, look at the model validation, I wanted to briefly tell you about how we go uh, about um, 
validating the model. The, the, the validation occurs on different stages. Uh, validation starts with uh, with uh, comparison with analytical solutions of the basic equations in a simplified way because, of course, the analytical solutions are very limited uh, and, and, and need to simplify the model to the, the, the equations to make it linear. Uh, but just they help in checking the code for several errors. Uh, then uh, we use uh, experiments, lab experiments that are available. Uh, and then that allows us to verify the, the different formulations that are implemented in the model. Then we go to the real cases. So there are, there are several steps that are uh, done and are always uh, published in, in high impact uh, journals, as, as you can see, some of the, um, of the uh, publications that have been published in the past. And there are some recent publications, um, mainly derived from the work of uh, Sergio Martinez, as I mentioned before. Um, these are very, very important papers that you may want to consult because they include um, not only the validation, but also the fundamentals of the model in, in, in quite uh, you know, a detailed way. Now, the, the validation that I want to present in this first part is the, the one that uh, we did with the USGS uh, large scale experimental data. Uh, USGS has a, it's a, a, a long canal that is used for almost real scale uh, experiments that are very well controlled. And uh, the publication is here is by Richard Iverson and colleagues. Uh, Richard Iverson is, is uh, a well-known researcher on the brief flows and non-Newtonian uh, fluids. And um, as a matter of fact, several of the, of the uh, formulations that we provide in the model are derived also from research that has been done by Richard Iverson and uh, Raid and other colleagues at the USES. Um, so this particular example uh, experiment is uh, is very useful because it's it's very steep. It's a very steep channel. Uh, it's uh, it's very well instrumented. You, so you have uh, different instrumentation that measure velocity, measure depth of flow, measure erosion. Um, and uh, uh, concentration of the of the material, run out distance because the canal ends in a almost uh, flat area at the end. Um, the material is is very um, diverse; it's not uniform. Uh, there is a dam upstream of six cubic meter of saturated debris uh, with known uh, granular properties. There is a gate. The gate is open at time zero, and then this material is let to flow down the slope over an area here that has a movable, movable bed. So there is a sediment initially located in part of the canal. So it's not a concrete canal all the way. One part of the canal is covered by sediment, so it's erodible. So when this material flows over the sediment, it can entrain sediment and, and bring it down here. Um, so it's a 95 meter uh, long canal, two meter wide. Um, they present uh, USCS in the uh, report experiments uh, with uh, different conditions. Uh, the sediment is formed by 50, um, 56% gravel, 37% sand, and 7% uh, mud size grains. And as I mentioned, there are several sensors that measure a number of variable, uh, even the poor uh, uh, fluid pressure here. This uh, uh, a short video, I will not show the, the whole video. Uh, but just so you have an idea, uh, you have the opening here. Uh, 
so it's it's very useful because it tells it tells the story of the uh, you know where the fluid ends this is in the in the dam this is the middle part that is filled with sediment This is a zoom in one part. I will show you some interesting uh, part here where uh, you will see something that uh, we were able to, you see these roll waves? See the roll waves again? Okay, just remember those, uh, this is the, the bottom part, but remember the roll waves because you, you can see them here to arrive in at the, at the flat area. Okay, so um, this, so what we did was to implement this in the river flow to DMT model. And um, so Sergio did all this uh, this implementation to check the developments that uh, he was doing during the uh, speech thesis, and eventually they became part of the Reverflow to DMT model uh, once they were checked and 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 uh, verified. So this is uh, this is the implementation in the model of the canal of the USGS canal, and what you see here is the volume concentration graphs. And this is an animation, as I move the animation, you will see how the concentration of four classes of sediment, fines, sand, gravel, and uh, actually three, uh, and the total uh, uh, volume concentration. And um, you will see here the density of the mixture, and this is the elevation. So initially we have this is the uh, inflow upstream, and, and this is where the uh, uh, material will end at, at the end of the simulation. And you will see at the move, this is the erodible bed part. So this is all numerical results, okay? See the roll waves? And this is how the, uh, if I restart this, this is how the concentration of each uh, class change in time. So you see how the different classes uh, concentrate mostly at the beginning of the of the coarser material. So this is a, an analysis of each of the of of the uh, stages. This is a three seconds after the uh, the gate open. So you have a um, first you see the increment in density in the frontal wave, and this is what happened exactly in the brief flows and tailings dam. The the coarser material concentrates in the front of of the of the wave as it moves, and and the lighter material in the back. And there are numerous videos that show this happening in reality. Uh, you see here how the, the frontal way becomes uh, uh, larger, finer fractions get concentrated more in the back. You see that as it moves downstream, the gradient is smoother. And then you see the roll waves forming and arriving at the, at the very end. So, um, this is very encouraging when when the, it was first obtained because uh, it, it's probably uh, a validation of of a very complex model, but uh, that gives you an idea of how close it can get to to reality. So, um, just to corroborate the results in in more numeric way, uh, these are different tests. I mentioned there there are uh, eight tests uh, presented. In, with different parameters, and we compare here the experimental data 
with, uh, with the numerical values. And what we see here, this is the front location as a function of time. So this is the, uh, the, the frontal wave as it moves uh, in time downstream. And you see the gray's experiments, uh, blue is the, the model. And you see that in almost all experiments, you see very close uh, comparison, except on this one here. And I don't recall exactly what happened here, but uh, uh, it's uh, nonetheless uh, very, very uh, close in, in different parameters that will change in between the, the cases. Now, how fast the model can run? Uh, just a brief overview. This is not the, the fastest. Uh, this was done last year. At that uh, last year in several experiments that we run with a mesh of uh, uh, increasingly higher number of cells, you, we could uh, obtain a speed ups up to uh, 27 times uh, faster runs with GPU with respect to uh, one processor run. Um, as we'll show you later, um, we, we are now, you know, close to 200. Okay, so um, I think. Uh, okay, let me let me complete this part, and then we'll do the first uh, uh, the first uh, pause. Okay, the, the graphical user interface of the model is, uh, is based on QGIS. Um, it's a user-friendly open source uh, uh, geographic information system. Uh, one of the advantages of using QGIS is that if you have a license, uh, of course, uh, Riverflow to DMT is a commercial model, but if you get the QGIS, uh, the, the model for QGIS, you can install in as many computers as you need and that's uh, the, the user interface that allows you to enter the data, create the meshes, um, create the, the model files, and, and also the post-processing of creating graphs, uh, uh, animations, etc. Is, is all free because it, it uses all uh, open source components that we have developed for QGIS, and QGIS that is also free, and, and that allows you to, to have as many users as you need, essentially. And you only need the license for running the model itself. So that, that's a big advantage. And um, besides the, all the, the advantages of using QGIS that provides functionality of a full uh, uh, GIS uh, software. Uh, so the model, uh, the, the, the plugin is based on icons that, um, that has different functions to generate the mesh, uh, export the data, do graphics, animations, cross sections, and, and tools. Um, when you create a model, you normally first import uh, a digital elevation model, as you see here. You have many layers that are in the River Flow 2D plugin for hydraulic structures, uh, rainfall infiltration. Uh, rating tables, um, bed fractions. Uh, I will go over some of this because some of them these are related to uh, the MT model, like initial bed fractions, uh, initial water surface elevation, and initial concentrations. Uh, you have all the tools to generate the mesh, refine the mesh, uh, enter the boundary conditions, and uh, the boundary conditions uh, for inflow and outflow. And then we have the data input program, and the data input program is where you work the non-spatial data. Uh, and the non-spatial data means, uh, you know, simulation time, outward interval, uh, data related to the fluid, um, hydraulic structures that you may or may not have, uh, the GPU computation if you use GPU or you use CPU. Uh, the type of card that you use, that you have available, uh, the outputs, options, and so forth. So when the model runs, it reports uh, on a number of parameters. This is a, um, um, a run of the uh, of the MT model that you see the not only the volume uh, discharge inflow and outflow, but also the mass inflow and outflow, the mass 
of uh, including the, the sediment and the, or the material. And some other uh, information that you get as the model is running. Um, now, in terms of the map creation, we have a wide variety of maps that you can create automatically. Uh, you have results versus map that you have all these velocity field, velocity magnitude, water surface elevation, depth, uh, accumulated rainfall, infiltration, uh, many more. You have the maximum result maps that allows you to show uh, maximum velocity, magnitude, depth. Um, I'm, I'm missing here for the, um, in the case of the MT model, you also have maximum erosion, maximum deposition, and, and other uh, maps that uh, represents the bed profile. Uh, time to depth, uh, we recently, besides the standard time to, to one feet or 30 centimeters, two feet or 60 centimeters and so forth, we added the, the frontal wave arrival time with variable, um, with de variable depth. So you can change and add a variable depth to determine the frontal wave arrival time map. Um, you can also um, explore hazard mapping. So you can generate hazard maps based on criteria from different countries, US, uh, BR that is available in the United States, uh, Switzerland, Austrian, Australia, UK. And, um, and then you can also graph uh, concentration and, and properties for say uh, volumetric concentration, the total concentration of the mixture, uh, density, viscosity, and yield stress. And then you can create animations. Um, the animations can be created for all, virtually all the, the variables. In the case of the MT for the concentration, density, viscosity, or yield stress. And uh, that uh, allows you to uh, look at uh, different variables. These are depth, uh, and, and you see here how the depth vary in time. But you can graph, for instance, how the bed change in time and how if you have erosion areas or deposition areas as well. Uh, the cross-section uh, output is very useful as well. You can create any cross-section and then uh, see uh, in the cross-section uh, the velocities, but you can animate the cross-sections as well. So you can see how the cross-section varies in, in time. And also you can see the numeric values. You have all the variables for along the, the cross-section or profile. Uh, bed elevation, depth, water surface elevation, velocity, fruit number, and then for the uh, for the mod as well, concentrations, and you have all the variables available for the, the cross section or profile. Okay, very well. So we are done with part number one. Uh, okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're here again to continue. Um, the uh, second part of the workshop on tailing stand break assessments with rear flow to DMT. Mm. Okay, so let's get started to in this second part. Um, before before starting with the uh, part two fundamentals, um, I wanted to complement a little bit on the uh, questions before uh, uh, um, Murilo made. Uh, uh, Murilo asked me about the SMS GUI and the differences. I mentioned the initial conditions, but I forgot to to mention that the graphical um, output it's also limited in SMS. In, in QGIS, you can make graphical output of uh, each concentration for each class for the uh, um, viscosity, density, yield stress, 
and you can make uh, maps and animations and cross sections for all of these variables. Uh, that is not available, unfortunately, on SMS. Um, now, I, I, I don't want to discourage you necessarily, but uh, because uh, you know, I think SMS is a very good software. The problem is that it's very costly to develop for SMS. And um, you know, our initial plan was to have QGIS and SMS development uh, going you know, in parallel. But the problem is that uh, I, I would suggest that 99.9% .9 of our uh, users uh, prefer going uh, with the QGIS version. Uh, that is not our choice, it's, it's their choice. And and what that tells us is that, uh, I mean, we, we provide both uh, versions, but as time has passed, um, we are uh, just focusing more on the QGIS development because that's what uh, most user, user uh, most users are are preferring. So that that's one of the reasons of that we are concentrating that besides the advantage of on uh, the programming and, and so forth. So I wanted to clarify that uh, for Murillo and, and others that are uh, SMS users. Now, in terms of the computational engine, that's exactly the same. So we use exactly the same computational engine for both uh, versions. Okay, there is no difference whatsoever in in the version. It's exactly the same executable. Everything is 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 uh, common, uh, but the user interface is is different. Okay, so let's get started with the fundamentals. Um, this this will be probably the the first. Uh, uh, presentation where we go in depth on more details on the uh, uh, fundamentals of the tailing stamp flow and the model that we use, the model equation. Um, and I hope we will clarify many of the questions that you have about the, the model. Uh, so we'll go over the model equations in depth, initial conditions and boundary conditions, some assumptions that we use in the model, or the and the formulations, uh, we'll take a look at the data that is required for the different options, the range of variations of some of these uh, key data that uh, you need to use, and uh, we'll end with a second look at the different uh, model uh, tests that uh, I think you will find interesting. Okay, so um, tailings flows is, I, I don't want to get you um, the idea that this is a, a, you know, a simple phenomenon. I mean, the, the model can do as much, but this is a very complex phenomenon. Uh, it's it has uh, the interaction of of two surfaces. One is the surface of the material with air or water. Uh, you can have the interface between the material and water on the underneath or the bed, the bottom terrain. The the material itself is composed of is a fluid essentially, but the fluid can solidify at some point, and the material is not uh, an homogeneous material. It's form of multiple uh, uh, particles and fluids. So you can have water, or you can have water with a high concentration of very fine material which makes it a very dense and viscous fluid that on top of that may have larger particles as boulders even large boulders or pebbles or you know gravel on the whole range um so and and the the way it 
they, they, the flow occurs, all the concentration of these particles change in time and in space. And you, you know, any model wanting to represent this realistically needs to account for all of these factors and how these factors uh, interact when the flow occurs over irregular terrain that may also have other fluid originally. It may be a river that uh, has existing flow or it can be a lake or a reservoir or even another type of tailings. So it's, it's a very uh, complex but interesting phenomenon. So that's categorized as a multi-grain mixture flow. Uh, multi-grain mixture because it has grains of different sizes, all mixture in a fluid. Uh, it occur over normally steep slopes because the dams are normally located in valleys or in areas where you have very steep terrain. Uh, the different phases or different particle sizes uh, concentrate differently. So you have higher concentrations of some of them in, in one area, like you see normally in the frontal wave, that you have higher concentrations of, uh, of larger, coarser material and then uh, finer on the tail of the flow. Uh, as the fluid occurs on over the bottom of this, the terrain or the river, the flow can entrain sediment from the bed. And that sediment contributes to change the, the constitution or the, the composition of the uh, mixture with some material that is not part of the original that started the, the tailings flow. Um, so all of these parameters change not only in time, but also in space. And the, the uh, conjunction of the, uh, or interaction of, of these uh, variables create a flow that is categorized as non-Newtonian flow or non-Newtonian rheological behavior, if you want to, to say in that way. Now, what is non-Newtonian rheological behavior? If you, if you are dealing with uh, a, a simple liquid as water, it's called water is a Newtonian fluid, as many, many fluids, uh, most fluids are Newtonian. Uh, what that means is that you have a simple and linear relationship between the shear rate and the shear stress. And as, as you know, the, the slope of this line here is the viscosity of the fluid. So if this is a linear relationship between shear rate and shear stress, then the fluid viscosity is constant, regardless of the shear rate. Now, shear rate in practical uh, terms is, is the, the, the effect that the, the difference in, in velocities that occur within the fluid, if you want to see it in a simple way. So the, the larger the differences of, of velocity, the, the, the larger their shear rate. So if you have a, a rapid flow of, of a fluid that is flowing over a, a, a solid surface, there will be a gradient, uh, vertical gradient of the velocity that has a, a higher shear rate. But what it means in a Newtonian fluid is that that shear rate relationship with shear stress is constant. And um, so the viscosity is constant. And also as the shear rate approaches zero, uh, you know, when the, the fluid is almost uh, uh, in, in, in static conditions, uh, the shear stress is also zero. Now, in non-Newtonian fluids, you have a very different and peculiar 
behavior. Uh, in many of the non-Newtonian fluids, you have what is called a yield stress. That means that in order to put the fluid in movement, you need to apply the certain stress or force that translates into a stress that is called the yield stress. Because if the yield is the stress applied on the fluid is smaller than this yield stress, the fluid will not move at all. It's different from water. You put water in any surface and it will start flowing as much as it can. In a non-Newtonian fluid, that will not happen unless you apply this minimum yield stress. And that has a tremendous impact on the flow that can occur. And as it happens, the hyper-concentrated multi-grain mixture that occurs in tailings makes the fluid property similar or makes it non-Newtonian, okay? So you will have in most tailings dam uh, break flows a uh, non-Newtonian uh, fluid flow. Now, the, there are different types of, uh, of uh, fluids. Some of them, after this initial yield stress necessary to put it in motion, exhibit a constant relationship between the shear rate and shear stress, which the viscosity is constant, but the yield stress is variable. Keep this in mind when we look at the um, data later. So some fluids, even Newtonian, can have variable yield stress or a yield stress but constant viscosity. Some other fluids, the viscosity can ch change. You see the viscosity is the, the slope of this curve. So you have different fluids can have different viscosity based on the shear rate. So the, both the yield stress and the viscosity can vary with this type of fluids. Now, what is river flow to the EMT conceptual approach to represent the flow of this type of fluids? We have, as I mentioned, two models. The constant property models is very simple and is applicable to some type of events, but not all of them. So the assumptions in the constant property model that uh, is to be the only one available until a couple of years ago, uh, it assumes that you have a homogeneous single phase mix of water and sediment. So it's a, sing it's a single phase uh, uh, approach. Uh, assumes that the density, viscosity, and yield stress is constant. Assumes that the bed of the river or flow area does not move in time. There is no interaction or exchange of material between the bed and the flow. And also assumes that the reference coordinate system is horizontal vertical. So there is no projection of the, of the gravity terms that I mentioned before. So it assumes quasi horizontal flow. So these are the main assumptions of the constant property model. So there is no way to deal with different concentra uh, concentrations of different particles or different material or none of that. That is not necessarily bad. There, there are some, uh, uh, this is an approximation and there are many uh, flows that could be represented with this type of model. So, uh, the assumption is that the fluid, even they, if they are constant properties, they are non-Newtonian, and the stress term includes the yield stress and also the terms that account for the, the viscosity change and also the latent uh, inertial grain sharing relation, but in a very approximated way, uh, I should say. Uh, some of the formulations that we include in, uh, uh, have the Coulomb uh, viscous relation for granular material, that include the Coulomb forces and internal uh, friction angle as well. Um, and, you know, provided that the 
There is no interaction or exchange of material with the bed and also the uh, concentration or other properties of the material remain constant. It's, it's a good approximation. The rheological formulations or relationships that uh, are included are these eight and uh, they range from turbulent, so mainly applicable for very dilute type of fluids down to granular flow. Um, now, in the data input program, uh, the data necessary to use the constant property model is very simple. You only need, uh, depending on the formulation, you select the formulation here. First, you select the constant property model, and this is new. As a matter of fact, none of you, none of, none of you users have this yet until later today, where we are going to release the version that includes these changes. Okay, so I'm annou announcing that now. Okay, this is the new version of the model. It will be 750 and includes a new uh, revamped uh, uh, modern tailings flow. Uh, I, I mean, the, for the, the, the actual uh, data is the same, but it's, I think, more, much more uh, clearer than before. So for the constant property model, you select the flow resistant relation. Uh, you select, uh, if, if applicable, the turbulent Coulomb requires an internal friction angle. You, you saw it here, this one here. Um, some other formulations do not require. And then you need to provide the viscosity uh, in, in either you know, depending on the units you are working, this is for metric is Pascal seconds, and the yield stress in Pascals. Okay, so you need it's a constant. However, if you and, and the density, okay, so density, yield stress, and viscosity, and in uh, depending on on the formulation you select, uh, this concentration here is only used to this uh, volumetric concentration to evaluate the constant viscosity and yield stress using the formulas that are provided here in this drop down menus this is the only purpose for this cv and and, and to calculate the, the density as well okay so there is no other use for this cv other than to uh be used in these formulas that are provided in this drop down uh, lists to select the viscosity. If you have your own estimate of the viscosity, you don't need to enter anything here. You just enter the viscosity, you select a user, uh, define viscosity value or the yield stress, the same thing. So these two values plus density are required. So it's very simple. Uh, also, I need to mention that this model, the constant property model, does not um, react or interact with rainfall. So the rainfall will not change the properties of the fluid, okay, or any tributary. If you have a tributary or if you have an internal condition in your model, with the constant property model, the assumption is that the properties of that material are the same as the properties that you put here. So everything will have viscosity, in this case, 7.57 or yield stress 0 0.38 and density uh, 2,247.5. The tributaries, the internal initial conditions, everything. Okay. Now, the variable properties model is, is very different. It's much more realistic, it's, um, but at the same time, it requires more better understanding of the physics of the flow, to, even to the practitioner. So our purpose, in this workshop is to provide you with the guidelines as a practitioner 
so I'm not interested in getting into the details, theoretical details of the of the uh, formulations. Uh, that is provided in the references and the publications that uh, that I can uh, reference to. But the, the the purpose is to give you the guidelines so that you understand the basics so that you can apply better the model. That That is the idea. OK, so what are the main features of the variable properties model? Well, first, water and solid material mass are accounted for separately. So the model considers the water separately from the solid material. They, they are uh, accounted for with different equations. And I will show you the equations. The mixture of the materials can be non-Newtonian. So they can exhibit it can exhibit the, the, the same behavior as I, I, I showed before. The solid material and the water move at the same speed. So this is an assumption of quasi 2D, uh, uh, I'm sorry, quasi two-phase uh, models or what is called the mixing phase or uh, mixed phase model. Uh, there are different terms for that. But what this means is that I, I think it's, a, it's almost two, um, uh, two phase model because the phases are considered separately. But the assumption is that the solid material travel at the same speed as the liquid phase. Solid and liquid phase travel at the same <clears throat> speed. Okay, that's the assumption in the model. But their relative concentration is is can be completely different. Next uh, feature: the bottom material can vary in size uh, and is distributed in a space, but remain varying in time. So you can have different sizes or grain size distribution in different areas of the bed but they will not change in time okay that's a limitation but that limitation will be relieved this year because we are working on a, an extension of this model that will account for variable um, grain size distribution, not only in space as they are available now, but also in time. That means that the composition of the soil or the bottom of the flow will vary in space and time. Okay? For now, in the model that you have or you will be, uh, you, 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 you can use, uh, the bed material can vary in space, but it's constant in time. Now, inflows can have different sediment characteristics and concentrations. So you can have an inflow of water from a river, and you can have an inflow from a river with high concentration of sediment, or you can have an inflow from a tailing flow that is coming upstream. They can have all different sediment concentrations, sediment uh, 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 flow rates, and they can vary in time also. Fluid within the mesh can have different solid concentrations and properties, both initially and in time. Fluid properties can vary in space and time. So concentrations affect, will affect, will vary in space and time and will affect density, viscosity, and yield stress in space and time. So that that it's in the present model. The bed or the bottom can erode and and <clears throat> and the fluid that is flowing, which is called the mixture fluid, the mixture here, can sediment and can change the surface that divides the flow 
fluid, the fluid flow with the terrain. So you can have erosion and sedimentation. The gravity terms consider the bottom slope. I was mentioning this morning that it's not a project, it's projected and it accounts for the gradients in the bed. And this is very important because it can have a significant impact on the results sometimes. This is very rare. You will find this in a in a model that uh, even uh, you know well-known models will not have this feature. Uh, a non-erodible layer can exist below the erodible bottom. Bottom, so you you can limit the erosion by uh, representing areas that uh, block can be rock or it can be uh, a surface that is paved uh, that limits the amount of erosion you can have and this amount of erosion can be as small as zero so you can have a paved surface so the flow can occur over a paved surface as philip was uh, as asking this uh, earlier uh, this will limit the erosion. It will limit the erosion everywhere if you want, or in some particular areas as well. And last uh, but not least, the rainfall can be considered. So you can include rainfall in your simulation. The rainfall assumes the rain is water, as is normally, normally the case, and the water will mix with the fluid flowing and um, represents the, the, the dilution or change in properties or change in concentration of the fluid. So these are the main features of the variable property model. Uh, now, um, I don't pretend to overwhelm you with the equations uh, at all. Uh, as I mentioned, my main purpose is to give you the key features you need here in order to understand how the, the model works and, and what you need to know to, to make, a, make you a better modeler for, for using the MT model. So there is one equation. This is the equation for the, the, the mass uh, or the, what's called the continuity of the, the mass conservation equation. Um, and, and we have several terms here. So we have Rho, which is the mixture density, is that this is the density of the fluid mixture that includes water and solids. So that's the mixture of water and solids of different sizes. It's what we call mixture, and the density is rho. Then we have we have H, U, and V, which are the uh, components. Uh, U and V, the components of the velocity in two directions, and H is the depth of flow. We have the depth, uh, the bed elevation uh, term. We have density. This density is the density of the solid class. This is a source term for the continuity equation that accounts for the exchange of material between the bed and the fluid. This is terms is the deposition flux, and this is the erosion flux. And each particle size or each class have, has its own term. And this is related to the porosity. We'll see later. This term is related to the porosity. Not exactly the porosity. This is 1 over 1 minus porosity, but it's related to the porosity. So some of these terms require data, and that's why I, I am focusing on, on some of them. So this is the gravity projected term that uh, uses the uh, gravity projected perpendicular to the bottom, not to, to the vertical. Um, so this is the bed, and these are the stress terms, this tau b in x and y direction. So we have one equation for mass conservation and two equations for momentum conservation. This equation is solved to get the depth of flow, and these two equations are solved to get the components of the velocity. Okay. 
So these are mainly hydrodynamic equations with, with source terms here. Then we have the transport equations for each sediment class. And I will come to the sediment class concept because I think it's key to understand many of the parameters required by the model. So we have this phi, phi one to phi n, we have here the assumptions, we have n classes of sediment or fractions. We are, we are now calling them classes. And, and this is the concentration for each class. So the volume concentration for class one to class n. They can represent sediment of different sizes and they are used to account for the different type of material or granular mixture that you have in the flow. Okay, so these are the main variables that we have in the model. Now, in addition to those equations, see you have, we have three equations for the hydrodynamic, one equation for each class for the concentration, and then we have the, this is an ex Exner type of equation for calculating the, how the bed changes, the bed elevation changes in time. And the bed elevations is related to the exchange of material between the flowing mixture and the bed. So this means if you have erosion, if this term overwhelms the deposition, the then the, the uh, bed will decrease in time. That means erosion. If the deposition the is higher, then you have increased erosion. Uh, in, I'm sorry, increased elevation because you have uh, more deposition. Um, now, these terms here, these exchange terms are obtained by these formulas here that are dependent on the equi equilibrium sediment concentrations. In the case for deposition, this equilibrium sediment concentrations is obtained by the solution of these equations here. So you don't need to say anything about it. But for the Entrainment of the erosion, you have, you need to determine the equilibrium concentration. And for that, we use the equilibrium concentration formulas. And they are all related in the user interface. I will come back to, to those. The equilibrium concentration formulas uh, allows to determine the, the flow rate of sediment. And in turn, the flow rate is related to the equilibrium concentration formula using this term here. Now, you don't need to know all of this in detail, but some of the parameters here are important. For example, for the erosion and the deposition, you have here this omega, which is the settling velocity. So the settling velocity will affect the exchange rates of, of uh, the either deposition or erosion. Um, this F is actually the fraction of each class in the bed material. This fraction is important because this is the composition of the bed material. So the, as the model considers variable bed material in the sediment bed that you may have, that will affect your erosion term. So uh, the last terms that are not so important because they are automatically set in the model is this alpha term and this M. Uh, this is equal to one in the, it's hardwire in the model. You cannot change that. And M is, is hardwire also is equal to four. Why uh, and what, what they represent? This one here, deposition term, accounts for the high concentration that you can have in the hyperconcentrated material flow. So this is a this is a, a, a power term that is used to represent. It's not the same that you have an isolated particle settling in a fluid, or if you have the same particle but highly concentrated in a highly concentration of solid material in the same fluid. And this represents that effect of higher concentration. Okay. Now, uh, since the model computes these concentrations here, 
this, this phi for each particle size, we need to calculate the, the material properties, the viscosity. Density is easy because they are re directly re related to, to the sediment concentration. Uh, the viscosity is more difficult, how the viscosity change with the material concentration or the yield stress. And it has been proved uh, accurate or approximate at least uh, to use exponential functions to relate the viscosity as a function of the material concentration and also for the density. And to that purpose, we use two correlation parameters, alpha 1 and, and beta 1, and alpha 2 and beta 2. And these are correlation parameters that can be obtained experimentally for different type of fluids. And in this case, we use, we provide in the user interface a number of correlations that have proved approximate in different cases. And, and, and you can consult those if you want. Or you can enter your own constant here if you measure those. Okay. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the sediment classes, which is a fundamental concept that we have in the model. And I, I say sediment classes now, but in the past we were talking about sediment fractions. And as you see here in the user interface, we have modified that and we, we are now talking about sediment class and not sediment fraction. Now, bear in mind that the data that you are going to be providing in this new version is exactly the same. We are just clarifying the terms here. It's not any different from the model. The model hasn't changed. We are just changing the terms in order to clarify them for you. So what are the sediment classes? If I could put it in a very simple way, imagine the sediment classes as a database of materials that you have for your model. So imagine that you, you have different materials. You have gravel, you have sand, you have uh, pebbles, you have uh, uh, clay. All of these materials, each of these materials can be a class. So they are types of sediment or solid materials that you have in your particular application. The, the classes can be can belong or can participate in different areas of your model. They can be part of the soil or bottom of the river. They can be they can belong to the tailings deposit. They can come from sediment transport in the tributaries coming into your area in different proportions or in different concentrations. So each class is identified by its properties, by its characteristic diameter, the density, and the critical stress or shield stress or incipient motion that it can have depending on the diameter. Okay. So these are the main characteristics that identify the classes. And they are entered in the table that you have in the model to enter as many classes as you need, essentially. Normally you have maybe four or five classes and each class can have a density. This is the solid density and we'd have clarified this here for each class. The in initial volume concentration, if you have volume in within the mesh initially and it's not identified by, by uh, a, a polygon, the fraction diameter that that identifies or uh, characterizes the class, um, the uh, bed material fraction, so the fraction of this class in the bed. Okay. Now classes may have percentage fractions in the bottom material. You see here the, in this example. So we have four classes, but only two are present in the bed material. 
look also that the sum of the bed material fraction needs to be equal to one. So 0 0.62 plus 0 0.38 should be equal to one. And this means that you don't have any material in the bed belonging to class three and four. So you only have material for class one and two. Okay. It could be in any other example that uh, this material is, you know, you have all the classes in the bed. That that's okay. But in this particular case, you have only two classes in the bed. Now you can also have different concentrations in the flowing mixture. So the initial this is the initial because obviously. The concentrations will vary in the variable properties model. You, you have variable concentrations, but initially they can have, uh, they can be present also in different proportions. So you, in this case also, you don't have, initially you don't have a concentration of these two classes in the, in the material that you have, uh, unless you have a polygon that represents that. And I will come back to that. Um, you can also have, in the inflow boundary conditions, different concentrations for each uh, for each sediment class. Okay, so you don't have sorry, sorry little. Let me let me make a pause. I saw a message here. Uh, I want to make sure. No, hello, hello, hello. Yeah, no, no, I'm checking the audio because I, I I click here on the microphone and I thought that it was not. Uh, um, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so um, we have here. Um, Inflow boundary conditions can impose different concentration for each class. So you have you can have a tributary with different uh, inflow materials. Zero concentration means that the class is not present in the inflow. So as we will see in the example that I will show you, if you have an inflow water tri tributary with the brings of river only with water, zero uh, sediment concentration, then your class will have zero inflow concentration okay uh, for all classes zero bed material fraction in the case that the class is not present in the bottom material is as in this two here porosity only applies to the material in the bottom layer okay so this porosity here is the porosity of the class in the bottom layer there is no nothing as a class of the flowing porosity. Okay, the flowing porosity doesn't exist. The only porosity applies to the bed material. Okay. Now, how this is entered in the model in the new um, mod tailings flow panel that we have for the variable properties. So now everything that you have here applies to the variable properties uh, model. Okay, so first you need to select the flow resistance relation. That is the, um, the turbulent Coulomb term here. Uh, and, and you select one of them. Uh, pore pressure factor, reference mixture density. Now it's called reference mixture density to clarify that this is for the mixture. It's a reference mixture density use in the pore pressure uh, term, it's only used, and, and based on the stability angle, this is the old uh, internal stability angle, they are all only applicable to the turbulent Coulomb and Coulomb yield uh, formulations. They are not applicable for the Bingham or the quadratic or the granular, okay? Only applicable for this one, these three, uh, at least these two. And the range is, uh, this is, should be on the order of one, a little greater than one works as well, maybe two. This is the reference mixture, greater than the water, for sure, a little 
squared, depending on, on the range you have, it's a reference. Most of the time, these are calibration factors, as well as the basal stability angle that is on the order of one as well. Then you can use the model as a variable viscosity or a constant viscosity. Remember the new, new, new non-Newtonian flow I mentioned that it can have yield stress, but can have constant viscosity? Okay, if you select, uh, do not select this uh, um, checkbox here, then you will work with constant viscosity, even if you have variable concentrations. Okay, it's up to you. The general model includes variable viscosity and the viscosity will relate to the concentration that is computed for every, um, for, for every time step and every cell and for every uh, particle size, uh, it will relate to through the formula you select here. And the same applies to the variable yield stress. The equilibrium concentration formula is the one that is used in the model to uh, compute the, um, the erosion uh, term here, the, the rate of erosion here, this, uh, this concentra equilibrium concentration uh, for for the P class, and it's uh, you know there you had several formulas and and this is the the one correspond to Wu, okay, and this factor here, this equilibrium formula factor, is one that multiplies this term and it's a calibration factor essentially. Settling velocity is used to, uh, you remember, it appears in both uh, the erosion and deposition terms. You can use different factors and also different uh, uh, formulas that are available. Uh, density of solid class is what appears in the equations at rho BP. So it's particular for each, it's a solid density. Okay, that's why you see these high values here and you, you see this 7,874 is for iron, because this is for an example for an iron mine. Uh, and then uh, you have the initial volume concentration for the, the classes that you have initially in the bed. This is the equilibrium formula factor beta that appears in the Wu formula. And the bed material fraction that is only applicable for the classes in the bed. Now, in the Coulomb uh, uh, rheological formulations, we have the, the pro, uh, uh, pore pressure effect, and, uh, and Sergio Martinez has done a, a very good job in his thesis about analyzing this term. And uh, the, the, the term affects the, the increased, what has been observed is that the, the, in, the, in the tailings flows, and debris flows, the high concentration of particles can affect the vertical distribution of pressure. So the pressure is no longer hydrostatic, it's higher than hydrostatic in many cases. How much higher is maybe uh, multiplied by a factor of 1.5 or 2 or 2.5? It depends. So you can have a, 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 an increase in the pressure uh, due to the interaction of the particles so when the particles are expanding or if you if you want to see it in that way if they are separating in time then then you have a, a, a decrease in the pressure and when they are contracting so they are getting closer together then you have an increase in, in pore pressure and that pore pressure is the one that is computed by the term that uh, is in the equations uh, then we have the the range of values for mud flow parameters. Then we can have the viscosity. The range can vary significantly. These are uh, uh, graphs obtained from these references here. Um, uh, and include data from from different authors. Uh, but you see that the range of uh, this is the variation of the dynamic viscosity as a function of volume concentration. You can see that they vary quite a lot. Uh, as as you uh, change in in volume concentrations, it is actually not realistic to have a flow with volume concentration greater than maybe 
0.65 or maybe 0.7 at tops, that uh, the fluid will become a solid essentially. So you you should never use a volume concentration larger than the value like that if you're using a constant uh, property model. And, and also the volume concentration affects the yield stress. And you see here that you can have yield stresses, measure yield stresses that exceed the 1,000 pascals, which is a very high value, maybe 1, uh, 1,200 or maybe even 2,000 can be a measure in some cases for, for very high uh, concentrations of, of solids. Uh, in terms of the initial conditions, the model uh, includes um, initial conditions that you can set for the water or material elevation, uh, initial concentration or initial bed fractions. So what this means is that you can set a polygon that have different uh, concentrations of the material at time zero. So uh, for that, you, you select a polygon you enter a polygon in your domain and assign a file, and that file has only one line, and that line has one value for the of concentration, initial concentration for each class. So this means that class one has a 0.1 uh, for a concentration by volume, class two has 0.2, class three is not present in that part of the fluid, and Class four has 0.25 concentration of that class. So the, the class identified by that polygon or the, the, the uh, condition identified by that polygon contains three classes with these concentrations at time zero. After that time, what will happen will be determined by the model. Um, so you can have different polygons of different fluids uh, initially, and they can have different water or uh, material elevation as well, de defining the water surface elevation layer. Um, now, you can have different bed fractions at different locations uh, in other areas different from this. And these bed fractions or different classes that you can have in the bed can be determined uh, with the uh, initial in, in the initial bed fraction layer, initial bed bed fractions layer. In that case, you assign a file, and that file contains the fractions present in the bed. Also, bear in mind that the sum, whatever fractions you select here, they sh should be equal to one because they contain all the fractions available in the classes. Okay, so. In this case, you have classes from one and two, and then uh, these are not present in this particular polygon. Okay, so uh, for setting the initial condition, finally, for the water elevations or, or uh, material elevation, you need to uh, select this option. And then uh, for the boundary conditions, you can also enter different material uh, um, concentrations. Uh, so in that case, you use the boundary condition layers. Uh, you enter the polygon that covers that layer inflow. And in here, you select a file that has the discharge or water elevation. And in this case, it will be discharge entering from here. And you enter one concentration for each class and each time. So the, the file has this format. You have uh, three lines in this case. Well, I don't show the three lines, but this is the number of lines. Uh, the first column is the time in hours. Second column is discharge in cubic meter per second or cubic uh, uh, feet per second, depending on the units. And the volume concentration, which is non-dimensional uh, for each class. So if you had, for instance, water flow, you would enter zero here for all the classes that you have in the project. Well, very quickly, model validation. Uh, I think I'm, um, I'm a little late in, 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 uh, in time, uh, a little uh, 
late, but uh, let me let me quickly go over this example because I think it's I think it's a very cool example of testing that we have uh, run. This is a, a case that uh, that uh, Sergi also did for for his thesis, and and you have here a mixing of two different density uh, uh, driven uh, flow. You have an inlet here and another one here. And, and then you have in this inlet here, you have zero concentration. So it assumes you have water flow only. And here you have a variable uh, concentrate, concentration fluid entering from here. And they mix here and flow downstream. So what we want to see is how the model represents the mixing of these two fluids in, in time and space. So, these are some of the results. These are depth at the left, and these are fruit number. This is interesting because these are supercritical flows. So you see here how the uh, the uh, the depth increases as the fluid approaches the confluence, and you have also separation in some of the uh, outer parts of the of the entrance here. And, and you see here how, as the fruit number changes in and, and creates this typical uh, uh, waves, standing wave patterns that occur in the, uh, in this case, you know, standing waves because they change in time, but they, these are the patterns that occur in supercritical flows for, for this particular type of, uh, of confluences. Uh, these are the detailed uh, you see the separation points here in the confluence. And you see here that this is non-symmetric because you have different density coming from the upper bridge. And these are the concentrations, how they change in time. And this is the cross-section over here. See the, how the concentration changes when the arrival of the fluid from here. And you see the mixing zone, how they change in space as you move in this canal downstream. So I think it's a very cool um, illustration of how the model handles the variable concentration and density of the fluid. So, okay, let's get started with part three. Uh, part three is uh, uh, an application to summarize what we have done. Uh, in the workshop and, and, and illustrate some, you know, a, a real application in this case is, is for a Brumadinho uh, a dam break. Um, we'll go over the workflow that we normally have, the initial conditions, the initial water surface elevation and the initial state. Um, the inflows, if you have inflow, we have, we'll have inflow tributaries, comparison with, with observations and some results. And then we'll we'll end up with another uh, Q&A session. Well, Brumadinho case, uh, I think you are more than familiar with the Brumadinho disasters called Brumadinho because of the population down, uh, the, the town that is downstream, but uh, actually it's Corrego do Feiao mine that uh, fail upstream. Um, and uh, we had the chance to, to simulate this uh, this event uh, this uh, video you have seen probably already many times this is what Marcos was saying that there was like a liquid type of flow or liquefied type of material coming initially um, yeah there, there are many ways to try to model this uh, but uh, yeah it's, it's a complex phenomenon that uh, um, I will show you what what we we did. So uh, we what we model with the variable uh, property model is the the initial state of the tailings in the Brumadinho uh, in the in the in the dam on the Brumadinho the, in the dam upstream. Uh, the the affected area downstream and the river. The, the Parahueva River downstream. So the Parahueva River is modeled as a, as a water flow, initial condition. So it assumes you have a constant flow um, and then that's an initial condition. So we run the model with uh, zero concentrations here 
in the model. And, and that flows uh, as a water flow, essentially. And then we have the tailings coming down and mixing with the, with the flow here. Um, I don't have time to get into a lot of details of the, of the data that we use. Um, this is the dam capacity, uh, the solid phase concentration that was used so was, uh, was very high, 50%. We use different size fractions or different sediment classes uh, that, has, that have different um, uh, initial properties. So we have different uh, classes with different size fraction, uh, different initial concentrations within the dam itself, and uh, different solid concentrations. Uh, you see that the uh, solid densities. You see these solid densities they use uh, for the iron, the uh, the magnesium uh, and and aluminum, etc. Um, and we use different porosities slightly different porosities as well. So what you see here is that we use one, two, three, four, five, six fractions, but in the bed, we only have two fractions. So these fractions are not present. Uh, I mean, are, are only, uh, this, these fractions are the only present in the bed. We don't have iron or a, any of the minerals. We only assume that we have silt and sand in the bed, okay? So this is what makes the model uh, that, that the fluid, the, the material characteristics of the terrain is different from the one that is flowing, okay? Also, when we have flow, even though we have this uh, six uh, classes, when we use the Paroeva River or when you model Paroeva River, the concentrations of the classes is zero. So we essentially are, are modeling water flow in the Paraueva River. So the steps that we follow to set up the model, uh, and this is the model workflow, uh, we first select and enter the digital elevation model with no tailings. Now in this particular case, the tailings are entered not as a constant elevation, but as another raster. So the digital elevation model is a raster and the with, without tailings, assuming there is no dam here. And then we have the, the tailings elevation that is another raster only in the dam area and in the deposit area. So these are the this will be assumed to be the initial conditions of 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 the elevation of the material. In addition to that, we can have a, an initial condition for the concentrations or the fraction if we want to model that as well. So we have initial concentrations and, and for that we, we have uh, an initial uh, concentration layer and we have uh, also the uh, domain outline with a cell size of approximately 10, uh, 10 meters. The Paraueba River is uh, considered as a water flow and for that we have only all the concentrations in the Paraueba River are assumed to be zero for all the classes. We did with several classes. This is only one class we tested at some point but uh, uh, all the classes that I mentioned before are assumed to have zero concentration entrance. Now, the questions that, what, that I got before, why do we need to enter initial concentrations if we set the, the uh, well, that's the only, the only uh, requirement. If you, if you enter here, this initial volume concentration is will only be applicable to that part of the fluid that is initially in the mesh at time zero okay and that is not defined by an initial uh, concentration polygon so 
That means that if you select, if you have an initial concentration polygon in an initial concentration layer, that initial uh, set of values is overreading. It's not used. Okay, so don't, don't you don't need to worry about that because it's the the actual inflow from here and also the initial values that you need in the initial concentration layer, the ones that it's going to be applied. Okay, so this is this is a clarification for that. Um, so uh, we um, we did the uh, the mesh. The mesh has uh, 380. Uh, 2,000 cells, uh, 996 cell and 66 cells. Um, the cells range from 3.6 to 12 meter in size. This is the area of the mesh in the dam site. Now, very importantly, in order to use initial uh, raster layer, you don't have a, uh, since we have a raster that does not have a constant elevation, we need to use this option here. So when you, you open the option uh, tab and then uh, select uh, the uh, using initial water surface elevation from the raster layer and select the raster layer that correspond to the dam elevations. So this is the deposit essentially in this raster layer. That will be your initial condition to start the simulation. So this needs to be set. That's automatic, but you need to check that. And in the tailings uh, data, then depending on the condition, depending on the resistance relation that you select here for the variable properties, you need to enter data or not. Uh, Laura was mentioning about the pore pressure and, and, the, uh, and the concentrations. It depends. So this data is only required if you use turbulent Coulomb. Uh, and, and now it's very clear. Probably in the previous version, it's, it wasn't clear because the, uh, the parameters would not disappear when you use a different resistance relation. For, for, now, for now, if you use Bingham, you don't need to enter at all any value here. You only need to enter a value if you use the, uh, you know, let's say turbulent yield or, uh, sorry, if you use turbulent Coulomb, then you need to enter the pore pressure factor and the reference mixture. And again, this reference mixture is one parameter in the formula. It's not the, the one, it's, it can be in the range of what you would expect but it's the the term that will apply when you have non-Newtonian behavior and when the turbulent and Coulomb, you will have concentrations greater than 20%. Otherwise, it makes no difference because in the turbulence and Coulomb, the conditions that applies for non-Newtonian fluid will only be applicable when the concentrations are higher than 20%. Okay, so uh, we run the model and we check that the variable density mode is set up for mud flow and you have the other parameters set up. You see here, this is the inflow condition that uh, the, the hot start for the Paraguayba River and the initial conditions in the, in the, uh, in the dam. Um, now we can uh, we can plot uh, many uh, many plots here, and these are the flow depth and flow velocity at different times. This is 2.5 minutes. This is interesting because uh, it's you see it's five minutes. You see how the 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 velocity the high velocities is propagating downstream. You see here that the higher velocities are no longer in the up, uh, upper stream. So at 20 minutes, they are already uh, mid-side between the, uh, the, the dam location and the downstream. Uh, this is an interesting uh, plot, I think, that shows the front location and the front velocity. You see that the front location 
uh, stops at some point after maybe 40 minutes. And you see here the velocity as it increases very rapidly and then decreases as the time passes up to the stop. So you get the stop of the flow eventually after approximately 40 minutes or 45 minutes. These are plots of the density uh, and the concentrations of different of the material. This is, for instance, the iron concentration at 10 minutes after the, the break. Um, and this is after 60 minutes, one hour after the break. You see that it has arrived already at the, uh, at the Parueva River. Now, the Parueva River, of course, acts as a diluted, uh, di dilution to the flow. Um, and, and, and you will see this here in, the, in an animation that I will show you. Uh, these are some comparison of the computed and observed um, some, some things that we, uh, we compare. The release tailing volume is very close to what uh, was observed. The affected area as well. The final model elevation at uh, cross-section 3. Arrival time at cross section four. Uh, these are very close um, values with respect to what was observed in the uh, in this particular uh, event. Um, so this this is interesting. This is the maximum, the plot of the maximum velocity. You see here the velocities at the dam site. And, and the immediate vicinity where the highest damage was occur. Velocity downstream was much smaller, obviously, because the, 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 the gradients were uh, attenuated significantly by this time here and this uh, distance. But initially, the velocities were extremely, extremely high in, in the uh, vicinity of the dam. Well, some comparison of observed and simulated uh, area, very, very close uh, comparison in not only upstream, but downstream as well. Here, uh, this is an animation of the uh, of this cross section. And it, it eventually stops. That's interesting because you see the non-Newtonian uh, effect. Uh, you see that the velocities are high at the, at the dark colors. So you see that they tend to zero as the, the, uh, the time passes. So eventually it stops completely. You see that the discharge is zero. Um, okay, I, I think I'm, um, well, this is, this is the final animation that we did uh, with, uh, just to compare, uh, some points and, and, uh, you know, the, the, the time of arrival. Uh, I think already, uh, talk about that. I want to show you an animation of the mixing part here you will see here how the uh, flow the, and this is this is concentration the total concentration of the material this is from the uh, the, the flow that is coming and you see the Parueva river the light color indicates zero concentration is water flow and you you see here how the the fluid penetrates the tailings penetrates in the Parueva river but eventually Parueva river dams uh, but then eventually it's able to entrain the material downstream and this stops essentially and uh, everything returns to zero concentration as time passes. But uh, this is a, a, an illustration of how the model can uh, represent the, the interaction of the tailings with an existing river and how the river can uh, you know, mix with the tailings and eventually dilute the tailings, uh, but but also brings the tailing downstream because the concentration of the tailings will be effective, uh, you know, and and uh, uh, you know noticeable downstream as well. 
this is another cross-section animation that you can uh, see. Uh, this is the Parahueva River that is dam. So eventually you have a damming of the river by the tailings and uh, the tailings uh, dam is eventually uh, destroyed by the Parahueva River and, and, and uh, the river start flowing back to normal again. Uh, this is a profile. I have no time to show that. I just wanted to show the the GPU-based acceleration that uh, we we updated, and this is uh, this is interesting. This is from from uh, Sergio thesis, and uh, you see here for with a Tesla V100 uh, that we can get accelerations of uh, the order of 200 times. Uh, so you see here the time. The simulation time for this is a uh, uh, 529,333 uh, uh, 39 uh, cells. So it's uh, roughly larger than 500,000 cells. Uh, it would take 59 hours if you run it with one processor in CPU. But it takes only only half an hour in a V100 uh, 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 card. So it's I find this interesting uh, number to keep in mind. Well, some closing remarks. Um, I think that uh, the the river flow to the MT model is is a very accurate, robust, and fast model to deal with uh, tailings dams. Uh, uh, there are numerous examples. Unfortunately, the, due to the nature of the projects, uh, we have access to many projects that unfortunately we don't have permission to disclose, uh, but there are hundreds of projects that have been done with the river flow to the related to tailings dams uh, that have obtained very, very interesting results. Um, uh, the, we, we cannot share them, but uh, I can assure you that uh, the, the results are, are very impressive and very accurate. Um, the, the multiple rheological formulations and integration with the pore pressure term, for particular for the Coulomb uh, equations, prove that the, the model can replicate the, the U.S. Uh, the, uh, the 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 USGS uh, uh, experiments very accurately, and uh, well, you have seen the, the many tools that the model has. The, the model has many other tools in the QJS environment, uh, and uh, with the GPU, it it can run many times faster than uh, you know the one core runs. <clears throat> so that that's all I had uh, that I had to.